Thank you, Tom, and thanks to Ray for inviting us to speak. It's, it's really great to have Ray joining our practice, and we're really proud to have him as one of our partners now. So I, I'd like to talk about root tears, and I think it has a lot of relevance to what you do as total joint surgeons. Here's my disclosures, none are really relevant to this talk. So root tears have been described as a silent epidemic. They're definitely not as rare as we thought. And in, in general, if we look at our practice and everything, most of us didn't even recognize them 10 years ago. They were often missed on MRI and arthroscopy. And the problem is they can lead to the rapid development of osteoarthritis because of the inability for the meniscus to resist the hoop stress. And all the cases in the past that were probably idiopathic spontaneous osteonecrosis were caused by root tears. And that's been shown now in prospective studies. What we mainly, mainly are talking about these radial root tears. So it's not a root tear avulsing at it's an actual attachment site. It's attaching, detaching just a little bit away from the attachment site. And these are basically the same as having a complete detachment, and this is what we treat clinically. And some of the literature, they're up to 28% of overall meniscus tears. This is what we usually see arthroscopically, so we'll see a radial root tear close to the root attachment, and it simulates a root tear both functionally and on overall imaging. In order to understand it, we have to look at the anatomy, and this is something we published on in AJSM a few years ago. And basically, the medial meniscus root attaches about a centimeter posterior to the apex of the medial tibial eminence, and it's really adjacent to the PCL. And why do we need to fix them? Because Chris Harner's group showed that it's equivalent to a total medial meniscectomy when we look at it because of the increased contract forces that are there. Uh, they also saw increased external rotation. Our group has shown that when you do have the radial root tears, both for the medial meniscus with Padalecki study and the in the lateral meniscus with my son Chris's study in JBJS, you can see there with the intact state and then the next one over, the root tear, and you follow it all the way along, up until a centimeter away from the attachment site, it's basically having the meniscus as totally defunctional. This is also showing it in more distinct ways that we use the tech scan. And orange and red is bad, so you can see that when you do have a root tear, whether it's right at the attachment site or a centimeter away, it's very bad on, in terms of the overall increase in force that's transmitted to the joint, but you can see with the root repair, it restores those contact forces to much back, um, basically back to normal. And what are the consequences of a non-anatomic root repair? So a non-anatomic repair is just when you put the root back in its place. The problem is that most root tears sublux posterior medially and become encased in scar. And I was seeing patients sent to me that had really great root repairs in terms of healing, but they weren't doing any better functionally. And I was going in and taking them down and putting them back anatomically, and they were doing much better. And so we looked at this study and found out when you do put the meniscus back only three or four millimeters away from its normal attachment site, it basically does not restore the function, and that's why these patients have issues. So you really have to release the meniscus and pull it back into an anatomic position. The lateral meniscus is something that we actually see a lot more than we ever thought. And the lateral meniscal attachment is only about five millimeters back from the apex of the lateral tibial eminence. So it's real close to the ACL attachment site. This is what they look like commonly. We see that they're, they're torn close to the attachment site and they can be either right at the attachment site or within the centimeter of the attachment site. And this is why you need to fix them. These actually do a lot worse than the medials in terms of the overall stress on the joint. And you can see by the, the color bars there that when you do have a six millimeter radial tear and you leave it or if you take it out, the joint's gonna be significantly overloaded. Same thing that we see here. This is another study we looked at with the effects of the meniscal femoral ligaments because that was thought maybe if the meniscal femoral ligaments are still intact, you don't have as much of a problem as with a complete root tear. But unfortunately, it still overloads the joint. And other studies that we've done have shown that it also, most of these occur with an ACL, that it'll increase the knee AP laxity almost 50% more than an ACL tear by itself when you have a lateral meniscus root tear. And it also causes a pivot shift to have more internal rotation. So if you do see a lateral meniscus root tear, which is usually present in one out of 10 ACLs, so if you do 10 ACLs a year, you should be doing one root repair. That if you, when you do see these root tears, that'll cause increased load on the joint that could cause it to stretch out. We also looked at one versus two tunnels what I was seeing with one tunnels when I was going back for the second look scopes when we were doing bone grafting and checking them is that when you have a one tunnel there, it tends to pooch the meniscus down. So we looked at trying to develop a technique using two tunnels to pull it down more anatomically. And we found out that it's basically the same biomechanically, but the increased healing is, is significantly improved in MRI scans. 
When we look at associated injuries with, with root tears, medial meniscus root tears usually cause articular cartilage problems, and lateral meniscus root tears are almost always associated with ACL tears. And unfortunately, we published on iatrogenic meniscal root tears for all four root attachments. We developed a classification system based on the tear morphology. Almost all of them are type two, which results in the radial tear with extrusion. So how do we diagnose them on clinical exam? It's really difficult because they don't often hurt as much as regular meniscus tears. It's almost always you have to have them stand up and do a deep squat where they'll have maximal pain with flexion. Sometimes you'll see a three plus Lachman test or a pivot shift test with a, a meniscus root tear. This is what the MRI looks like. This is the ghost sign where there's a lack of meniscal tissue in the sagittal images as you sequentially follow it across. And this is pretty classic for a root tear. Also, we'll see sonk. So we publish this now in systematic reviews. When you do see this, it's because there's a root tear causing the meniscus to extrude and it ultimately leads to overload of the compartment. Also, when we're looking at them, what we want to do is go back and identify the attachment site. And you can see I'm, I'm trying to release the meniscus tissue from where it's extruded. So that's the first goal of a meniscus root repair is releasing it and trying to make sure you can pull it back into a more anatomic position. The next thing is to decorticate the bed because the meniscus is not going to heal very well unless there's a good prepared bed. So we like to use a curette to do that and make sure we thoroughly cleaned out this area. So once you've done that, you can see we can pull it back into an anatomic position and make sure it has a better healing environment. Then we'll drill our tunnels. You can use any type of technique. We, we like to use one where we can place in two cannulas that are threaded to be able to later pass sutures and um, make sure we put it back into an anatomic position. Passing the first suture, there's different types of devices out there where you can pass the meniscus suture through the meniscus device and ultimately you can lead to shuttling that down the cannulas you've already placed. So it's a lot easier than some of the techniques where you're coming from the back of the knee and, and using rotator cuff repair instruments. And here you can see I'm shuttling the suture down and then we can pull the meniscus suture into an anatomic position. Do the same thing for the second one. So we've got the first suture in place, and we'll place the second suture, making sure we've got good meniscus substance, which is very important for these to make sure that the meniscus heals appropriately, and then we'll get it down in position. Then I tie it over a button. We found out in our biomechanics lab when we tied it directly over the tibia that it tend to loosen over time with cyclic loading. So I like to tie it over a button to make sure that we have the best chance of not having it loosen up. Then we'll make sure that it's healed. Rehab-wise, based on our tech scan studies, we try to make sure that we don't have them flex past 90 degrees for the first two weeks because it overloads the meniscus quite a lot. And our Korean friends have done a lot of second look arthroscopies where they found out that patients that weight bared in the first six weeks had a higher rate of re-tear. So we try to avoid weight bearing and too much flexion in the first six weeks. Clinical outcomes, you can look at the systematic reviews which show these patients do well. Um, probably the second one is the most important for this meeting where this is a second paper that showed that patients that were less than 60, 78% of them had a root tear that contributed to their arthritis. So root tears cause arthritis and it may be a cause of total knee arthroplasty in a lot higher number of patients than we appreciated in the past. Here's our outcomes. We looked at 50 patients in, uh, in their knees over time. We found out there wasn't any difference between those that were less than 50 and older than 50. We had three failures and we did a re revision surgery on them. And overall, they did very well, and there was no difference in medial versus lateral tears and no difference in outcomes based on age. So in conclusion, it's important to make sure we don't miss root tears. Uh, calculations at multiple sites now, there may be one out of 12 knee scopes and one out of 10 ACLs. If we do see spontaneous osteonecrosis, that's a root tear until proven otherwise. Age doesn't seem to matter. These heal very well, but the cartilage status does. And consider a two-tunnel transtibial repair for these and follow proper rehabilitation to get maximum outcomes. Thank you.